Welcome to part 3 of the 755 Followed Me Home project. If you haven't seen part 1 or 2, I'll put links down below. In this episode, we get the radiator and head out of the way and take a look inside. Previously, I thought I could leave the radiator and the oil cooler in, but since we're going to be taking the thing apart, it makes sense to go ahead and follow the manual and take the uh, oil cooler and radiator out. The overall problem is that the oil cooler is trapped and also traps the radiator. Consulting the manual, it simply states, remove cap screws A, disconnect oil cooler lines B, and lift cooler base from clips. We're at that simple. This is the situation. The cap screws are simple. The oil cooler lines are not. The front line can be loosened with end wrenches, but the back line is against the radiator frame and no clearance for tools. The book indicates that there's a clamp underneath that holds the two lines up. So I thought what I could do, if I remove that clamp, I could take this line loose first. This would then allow this line to slip below, and then I could attach the two wrenches to these here and uh, disconnect both of these and then lift the oil cooler out. But as you can see, you can't force those lines down anymore. Both lines are solid, so the front line cannot be pulled forward without disconnecting it from the transmission. A clue to what's going on may be found in Important Warning and Items 8, 9, and 10. My guess is that the front line must be distorted to get it out of the way and provide access to the rear connection. But back to the cooler body. An executive decision was made to wrestle with the oil cooler body and get back to the fittings after the radiator was out of the way. Here's my speed wrench. Anytime I can, I like to put these special bolts back into their hiding places so I don't have to keep track of them. And I don't know where they go. The upper right hand bracket is trapped behind the bracket on the radiator frame. It can't come forward and away from the radiator. The cooler can't be raised enough to clear the lower clip due to a nut that's spot welded into the bracket, and the cooler tab can't go below the bracket because it is again lodged in the lower clip on radiator frame. The front left bracket has similar restrictions and interference with the lower clip as well. However, it terminates closer to the bolt hole and may be coaxed to tractor left to let the tractor right tab to bypass the upper bracket. Then, the tractor left side can be pulled forward and up to clear the clip below. What we'll do is pull this oil cooler out a little bit more here at the top. It's out of this slot and we'll try to now bring it back toward us this way. Being careful not to bend any fins. Okay, it's kind of loose there. Now with a little little persuasion. There. How about that? Now, hopefully, this is going to move forward. If not, maybe we can just go ahead and take the, the radiator out and then loosen those. Let's take this uh, upper radiator hose loose. The clamp wasn't very tight either. Doesn't look like it's been leaking. Yeah, I think that's what it's gonna do. There we go. Nice and dry inside. Okay, that lets the radiator rock and roll. After removing this clamp and shroud bolt from there, I was able to find that the upper solder joint here was busted. When I'm having trouble getting a bolt out, I like to get it as far as it comes comfortably, then put a little bit of uh, WD-40 on it, screw it back in, that kind of coats some of those threads, and then it'll come out easier, a lot easier than drawing them out. Now that it's in and I have access, I'll put a little dab here on the end of it. Now 
this has saved this little technique has saved me many hours of getting out difficult bolts. Well, there's a little antifreeze at this level. Okay, good to know. Well, I admit this isn't pretty, but this is what it is. Uh, I've had to back this bolt in and out a number of times, but finally getting it and dropping it on the floor. That piece is loose. The fuel line and injector return lines are isolated by a foam pad or grommet held captive in the lower radiator frame. Prior to removing the radiator, first remove both lines from the fuel tank sending unit to prevent them from siphoning fuel from the tank. Then remove them from the fuel pump, injectors, and drain the fuel in a suitable container. While I was in the way, you couldn't see me draining the lower radiator hose and preparing to take it off the radiator. I'll also mention that the coolant level was at the bottom of the lower water pump intake port. Also, there were no apparent water leaks noted. There we go, my radiator. Because we're going to be taking pretty well everything apart, the next step is going to be to take the fuel pump off, fuel filter, and this line to the injection pump. So I'll just do that and uh, come back to you when that's done. I don't know if I can catch this. But when I open this up, it's not diesel fuel. It is, it's clear. It didn't have a, a red cast to it. I opened the filter outside in case it made a mess. But I brought it in. And uh, here's, the, here's the filter container. And pour it in and see what we have. Well, certainly not red diesel. Well, it doesn't have any water in it. It doesn't really smell like diesel. As a matter of fact, it doesn't look like diesel. And it doesn't really slosh around like diesel. And after taking a whiff of some good old number two in the 955, I'm pretty sure that isn't diesel. Pretty thick. What do you think it is? Take the air cleaner bracket off the back. These bolts are a lot easier to get to now. And we might as well relocate the lifting hook here. But pulling out some wires. Okay, we've got to take First of all, let me take the power, the uh, oil pressure sending unit wired off. Of course, it's a Phillips. And the four screwdrivers I found were all flat. Well, going through everything I knew or had, I found a 930 seconds. That's a common size, isn't it? And we also want to pull the wires off the sending unit. The one on the driver's side, the right side, has the color stripe. So I think most of the wires are... And then on this side, okay, we we'll take the alternator wires loose, push down on the top, that clip comes out, roll this back, there, that's broken loose, usually these will come off pretty clean. Yeah, there you go. And while I'm at that, pull the temperature sending in the wire. Finally, that little guy let loose. This wiring harness is ready to drop down this far. Yeah, it just slides out. No clips on it. I want to show you something else back in here. It's always nice to find chopped off wire. I guess you can kind of see where it goes. It's back into the, into the starter. So 
So we'll have to figure out what that is. Okay, this is what I've decided to do. I'm going to leave the engine in place while the head is removed. I'll be able to inspect the valves, pistons, and cylinders and see what condition they're in. This will then guide me the next step. If the treble can be repaired, parts can be ordered, the machine shop can, to uh, true the bores can be scheduled, and then the engine can be pulled and prepped with the shafts and all out of it. The second thing then I'll do is put a price on that repair and making it whole again. And lastly, decide to repair it or junk it. In either case, the head can be dropped back on to pull the engine. Note though that one of the lifting hooks is missing, but that's okay, I have another one. So to get started, taking the alternator off. Cute little fan and spacer. Okay, there's a bushing. And then I'll be ready to come off. Next thing we'll do is get the tachometer drive off. Okay, first thing we'll do is take the valve cover off. We already had it loose from when we were doing the compression test. And it smells like ether. Really smells bad. These bolts here are 7 millimeter, but I don't have one, so I'm having to use this 930 seconds. So we'd have to break this little guy loose so the lines can be separated, especially so I can get in here and get the injector line off of number 3. got to tell you, it's strange thinking about these cylinders numbered 321. Just odd. Not used to it. When you crack these injector lines, you want to use two 17 millimeter wrenches. You put one on the fitting that's in the pump and drive the second one loose, leaving the one in the pump. Yeah, didn't come, that wasn't bad at all. Okay, so we've got. All right, this is number one, so we'll do the same procedure to keep this guy from wanting to turn. And we'll crack that line loose. Okay, that's all right. Well, I'm going to need to clean this as best I can. And we're going to take this line off because we have to get it uh, off of the injection pump so we can get access then to these other injectors. And the other injector nuts. There he is. I'm going to keep these injectors clean. Okay, we're loose there. I'm not sure I'll be able to get this one off here. To show you, you get another seal. I don't like getting any dirt in these systems. All right, I'll have to get. little guy out of there. There we go. So there is number three injection line. And you want to put it with the open ends down. These lines can have some spring in them if they've been monkeyed with. problem is with these two ends, or the, the, the number two line, I can't get the wrench on it down here. I 
Okay, now the trick I think here is going to be to thread a box end Careful. Keep that end clean. Keep that box end around here. If I can slip it past the... Let me show you what's going on. I can't get an end wrench in here to do any good, so I'm bringing this box end down and I can feel it tight there. These are the ones you really have to be careful with. Now I'm going to have to take the protective cap off. They go on a lot easier and they come off. You have to twist them off. Lock it in there and hold your breath. Okay. <clears throat> and there's number two. With the injection lines out of the way, we can turn our attention back to the injectors in these bypass lines. Uh, I can't get the socket down on the head bolts here with these lines in the way. So we'll hold the injector base just to be sure and crack the top. Disclaimer. I had experience with pencil type injectors and was unfamiliar with the architecture of the pencil injector. I did however learn about it the hard way. The assembly consists of a nut that seats the nozzle and is the base of the injector. Next is a housing that traps the internal parts of the injector. Above that is the fitting that connects to injector bypass lines and at the top a nut secures the fitting to the housing. If you make a mistake, as I did, and not hold the housing when loosening the fitting, the injector can accidentally be disassembled. That's not good. What appears to be a round part of the assembly is actually a place for a 19 millimeter six point wrench to keep it tight to the lower nut. Hold it in place and the injector assembly will remain intact and can be removed as a single unit. Well that one was already loose. Okay, there's a seal in here and what we'll do is try this fitting up. There. Clean the best the dirt around there best I can. We're going to have these injectors cleaned, checked and cleaned anyway. Call it a bronze washer. Well, now that those fittings are all removed, um, we can look at taking the injectors out. But because of the lack of clearance here, I think what I'll do is remove these three head bolts. That'll give us access, maybe that one, to the injectors and get them out of the way. But before that, however, we need to drain any water that's remaining out of the block. Nice to catch it in the bucket this time. Well, not all of it. These are 12 millimeter, easy to get to. Let's see if we can bust it off of there. What have we got? The parts book shows number. 17 to be an o-ring and nothing else that holds it in there. So it should come out. 
What I'll do is try to pry it back this way. Again, this would be the water pump removal tool. Okay, we're going to use my favorite wrench. Put her on extension. And here we go. Oh, this one. These two look like they have pretty pretty similar they smell like gas. This one has some rust and corrosion on it there. Well maybe it's not, but it is rusty in there. Now to get to these two head bolts in here, we'll take the uh, rocker loose. Break them loose a little bit at a time. Relieve the valve spring pressure. And there, all three bolts are loose. Now we can remove the rocker arms, set them aside. Okay, we take the push rods out. Cylinder three. The caps the same way. They want you to put the same ones back where you got them. Well, with all of that fooling around done, we're getting really close to finding out what's going on here. So let's break the rest of these guys loose. And take her off. See what we find inside. No reason to add more dirt. Ah, it didn't feel so tight. Neither did that one. That one's more snug. Like the other ones were. Similar. Uniform loose. So this first bolt and these two head bolts back here were relatively loose. At least they weren't didn't feel like they were down to spec and they were considerably uh, less tight than these others. Alright, we're at the place where a bunch of us have been waiting for. Let's pull that guy off of there and see what we find. Get some gloves on. Make sure the camera's running. The battery's good. I guess it is. All right, let's see what we find. Let's see if it'll come off. Good thing we have a lifting handle here. All right. What does it look like? Huh, looks like a new engine. We'll study this later. Coming up in part four, 
we'll take a close look inside and outside the engine and plan the next attack. If you have any questions or suggestions, chime in. And thanks for watching.